Welcome to the Lorecast, where we look into the lore and the stories by which we live. I'm Dr. Craig Chalkwist, and you can find us at chalkwist.com slash podcast and at a number of other online venues. Who was Carl Jung? Well, we know he was a Swiss psychiatrist, born 1875, died 1961, lived his life in uh, Switzerland, traveled a bit, wrote a number of controversial books, trained analysts. All that is pretty easy to verify, but who was he really? Mystic? A Gnostic, which he denied? Something else? We're going to go into this a little bit. I've taught Jung's work for almost 20 years now, and in a variety of venues, including graduate school, to uh, PhD and master students. I've presented on Jung... Uh, I've written about Jung, and along the way I've gathered some information, and what has really helped for all of us to understand Jung the man, the individual, apart from his work, was the publication of his Red and Black books. The Red Book is basically a distillation over a four-year period of the Black Books, and the Black Books are Jung's journals, but they're remarkable journals. They're journals of exploration on the part of a a fairly successful psychiatrist around the age of 40 who one day woke up and realized that his soul was missing. So if you want a tour through the Black Books, there's a number of people online talking about it, and I actually have taught a course online for Young Platform uh, on the Black Books. The journey into the soul. So there's a lot of information about all this. The Black Books stretched over a 19-year period, and Jung was quite frank about his internal process as he wrote in them. So we we now have that to draw on, thanks to Sonu Shamdasani and a number of others who persuaded Jung's family to let the Black Books be published. So let me start by giving you a brief bit of biography about Jung. There's so much available on him that I won't spend much time on this. I just want to underline a few interesting points about what makes Jung unique. And then we will look at this question, who was he, in a, in a deep way, who was Jung? So Jung was born into an interesting family. His, fa- his uh, father was a Swiss reform pastor who seems to have been losing his faith. And so when his highly intelligent son would ask him difficult theological questions, oftentimes uh, his father would retreat into, well, you just got to take it on faith, and which to a highly intelligent kid is no answer at all. And so that was not helpful. So Jung collided a lot with his father, and he seems to have perceived his father as weak and um, in need of some protection. And so Jung, who from the start had a burly personality, big personality, big body, big presence, uh, he needed someone to collide against, I think, and his dad wasn't that person. So all this shows up later in Jung's difficult relationship with Freud, I think. But in any case, um, Jung's mother came from a long line of women who were visionaries, and in fact, Young's doctoral dissertation was on the psychology of mediumistic experiences. That was the prize work side of the family. And so Young's experience of his mother, as he himself admits at times, was problematic because she was in and out of daily reality. She had a bit of a dual personality, as Young describes it. And at times she was, you know, a loving and helpful Swiss housewife of the time, and at other times she was this uncanny seeress who would say things that were hard to understand. We know also that there was a period of separation when Jung was young, (laughs) as a boy. Uh, She, at one point, was hospitalized, so she seems to have been either on the point of psychosis or subjected to bouts of psychotic behavior and and uh, process, which for Jung was frightening. And he says in in, uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which is more a collection of his writings as edited by his secretary, 
than a true autobiography. But he mentions there that it gave him a sense that women were unreliable, and he seems never to have overcome that. So an absent father um, intellectually and then uh, and emotionally, and then a mother who was dipping in and out of other worlds, this was what Jung had for family. His sister didn't come along until much later. And Jung was naturally introverted, so he spent a lot of time by himself. He had a rich fantasy life that nobody understood, so he just cultivated it by himself. And he was highly creative. He would make, during his play, a lot of um, little miniature towns and forts and stuff like that. Um, he was interested in art pretty early on, and the artistic renditions and paintings that go with his Red Book are just remarkable. They show a high level of craftsmanship. I think Jung could have been a successful artist, but he felt that his destiny was psychology. So here's this lonely boy sitting on a rock wondering where his consciousness stops and that of the rock starts and connecting with the natural world in a fairly deep way that stayed with him throughout his entire life. As we can see from his red and black books and his numerous writings that emphasize the importance of connecting consciously with the natural world. One thing we should note at this point is that Jung inherited in full measure the visionary gift that was passed down through his mother's side of the family. He saw visions, he had a rich imagination, he was interested in spirituality from a very early age, and these were things that, in a very reformist Christian setting, weren't always welcome. And as Jung found out when he went to college, the scientific worldview of the time was heavily materialist and reductionistic, meaning the inquiry was all about reducing everything to matter. And so Jung's visionary capabilities weren't welcome there either, and he was careful to conceal them. And this was a tension throughout his entire career, how much to reveal without endangering his reputation as a psychiatrist. He was an excellent company. One of the reasons that William James, who was a contemporary, left psychology was because the emphasis was increasingly behavioral and James didn't feel that his interests and experiences matched this. Keep in mind that William James was the author of the famous book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, which has never gone out of print. Same thing with, with uh, Gustav Fechner. Uh, he was known by day as a research psychologist. At night, though, he was a nature mystic, and he wrote thick volumes of nature mysticism under a pseudonym that so far have not been published in English, although William James resurrected some of those writings, a few of them, just excerpts. And he mentions them in a pluralistic universe, and they're really quite beautiful, imagining the earth as a vast angel, a vast living soulful entity, for instance. So Jung is in this lineage, and um, throughout his career, struggled to find a way to include spiritual experience in depth psychology. Depth psychology being the field that studies the relations between the conscious and the unconscious. It has quite a long heritage. Uh, Freud and Jung are often the people most readily associated with depth psychology. It was actually named such by uh, Jung's boss, Eugen Bloiler, the head psychiatrist at the Berkholzli Institute, where Jung practiced for a while. At this point, you might be asking yourself, why would somebody with such a rich gift for vision and such a rich imagination be searching for his own soul and feel like he's in a state of soullessness? Well, like we all do at times, Jung had to make some compromises as he got older. So he had to learn scientific psychiatric techniques. He was actually a research psychiatrist at one point. And there was that whole worldview, that materialist worldview that goes with it. He had fairly recently, and I'm talking about 1913, 
parted ways with Freud uh, very bitterly, actually. There was a lot of um, mutual projection going on. Uh, Freud seems to have been the dad that Jung always wanted to push back against and impress. And then Freud had his stuff going on with, with uh, Jung, who he considered a kind of son figure. But be that as it may, Jung had been moving in psychoanalytic circles as psychoanalysis was in formation. And so he was dropped from all that. He left the Berg-Holsley Institute. He seems to have been having some problems with his marriage. And that all by itself introduced some interesting dynamics for Jung's life because he ended up marrying... Uh, the second wealthiest woman in Switzerland. She was part of uh, an industry that made clocks and watches. And so by marrying her, Young got into that world, although he was a fairly inactive board member for the industry. But even so, his circumstances vastly improved from the somewhat peasant class upbringing that Jung was used to. He, were, he had memories of going to school in rags, basically. Um, his family was kind of on the poor side. Jung, as he admits in his black book, was possessed with the desire for fame and admiration and success, as we would now call it. And so all of that hugely increased his conscious self to the detriment of his unconscious, which was down there simmering and muttering and getting ready to explode. So when Jung was at about the age of 40, he had some very troubling visionary experiences on two train rides and um, decided to conduct an extensive self-analysis to make sure he wasn't suffering from a psychosis like so many of his patients had been. So the result of that, results of that, were his red book, black book, and also his form of depth psychology. When all this uh, imagery and this visionary material, which he accessed through his imagination, started flooding into Jung, at first he worried that he was menaced by a psychosis, as he put it. And a lot of the imagery was very disturbing, a lot of blood and death and warfare. And so when the First World War broke out, Jung realized that the visionary material in part had been pointing to a collective event. So one of the most important things that Jungian psychology gives us is a set of tools for trying to determine, and it's not always entirely possible, the difference between when collective events are building in such a way that they are also stirring inside of us in the form of perhaps dreams, fantasies, what have you. And when the material is really ours and really belongs to us personally. And part of the problem at that time and at our, our time as well, actually, is that most psychology treats all of the material as personal. And so we have a number of us running around out there in the world who are sensing collective events all the time. And if we stick to a purely personal psychology, then things like uh, climate chaos become problems with your mother. So that's not helpful. So Jung was working all this out, um, not, in, not entirely alone. He had colleagues. He had Tony Wolf. He had his wife, Emma. Other people, too. It was actually a team effort that was going on. And um, the, the stories that come out of the origin of Jungian psychology as being just young as the brilliant creator are somewhat false because they don't take into account how he was running ideas past other people. He was sharing his process with them. It wasn't just him. So I'll do credit to his courage and intelligence and intuition, but there were other people involved as well, and we need to realize that. Credit to Young also for showing how clearly the psyche is full of mythic figures, figures out of folklore or fairy tale mythology, you name it. They're all running around in there. We see them in dreams, and when I teach dreams and um, facilitate dream groups, because I have something of a background in mythology, I can recognize when these characters show up in people's dreams. And when they do, they link us to collective concerns 
they link us directly to the time that we're actually living in and the collective pressures that are going on all around us and they encourage us to respond to them so there's a figure who came up for young in dreams and active imagination and he referred to her by different names uh, the usual one was soul s-o-u-l and she shows up sometimes as the biblical character Salome, sometimes as a black snake. She takes on other forms too, a little girl. But she was a wisdom goddess and teacher. Um, the old term is psychopomp for young. And throughout the whole stretch of the Black Book years when he was actively working on himself in his journal, she's the figure who shows up the most, although many others do as well. And so... One learning from this for Jung was that these so-called imaginary figures are actually imaginal, to use Henri Corbin's term. They're figures that are real, but they're real in terms of the imaginal realm. They have their own values, their own opinions, they express unconscious dynamics, they're to be taken seriously. So that was one thing Jung gave us in, by showing us his work, showing us his encounters. But also these uh, mythological figures who populate our, our dreams and our fantasies and our art, of course, and movies and everything else. The one who seems to have been so important for Jung, the figure of soul, I believe was Sophia, the wisdom goddess. And she shows up in different forms across different pantheons. Sometimes she looks like white buffalo calf woman. Sometimes she looks like Nuwa in China. Sometimes like Saraswati. And Young, being a Westerner, usually encountered her with Western imagery. So that's why one reason I say Sophia. But I'm not sure Young ever consciously realized she was his guide. He, of course, had a lot of conversations with her, and he spent a lot of time arguing with her as well. But she was really there for him and would give him specific suggestions sometimes when he was engaging her in active imagination, which is a kind of sustained daydreaming in which you hand over your consciousness to whatever figure wants to show up and talk to you. One of the problems that Soul and a number of the other figures confront Young about is his, as we would now say, narcissism, his egotism. And he himself criticizes this in, him, in his uh, life, in his ambitions, his desire for recognition. And he seems to have worked through a lot of that. Um, I think a tinge of it remained. And you can see this, for instance, in the attacks of rage he was famous for. And then, of course, he collected people around him who would make excuses for it and say, well, he was burdened by his ideas, or he taught me so much by yelling at me, which is just enabling, right? So that was one thing that comes up very clearly. He's, he's suspicious especially of the feminine figures who appear to him in dreams and active imagination and life, for that matter, um, daily life. He is uh, somewhat egotistical, and he has what the inner figures call an, a religious mania. Um, he, he seems to be obsessed with religion and with saving Christianity from itself. Jung was aware, like a lot of people are, that in some forms, Christianity was purely external. It, it had lost its soul and just become procedures and authority and obedience. Whereas at its origin, it had a very rich experiential and, and wisdom tradition, especially revealed in the Gnostic writings of long ago. So Jung was aware of all this, and he was always trying to put Christianity on a more psychological footing. And... Um, that usually didn't get a very favorable response, especially from clergy. So that was a sort of a, uh, maybe a redeemer complex in Jung himself. And he gets made fun of that in, the, in his active imaginations. So he seems to have suffered from that as well. And he, at the beginning of these adventures, uh, he, he's very petulant and argumentative and intellectualizing, you know, and trying to get his way. He's a bit of a bully, actually. But that changes as all this goes on, and he undergoes pretty deep transformation. Since we're talking about some of Jung's character flaws, I should mention one that comes up a lot, 
uh, in critical studies of Jung, which is his racism. Um, part of which is also his anti-Semitism. So I want to deal with the racism first, specifically. And what we need to understand is that the defense of Jung as being a man of his, a white man of his time, is um, really not adequate. And so when he repeatedly talks about indigenous people as childlike and primitive, or uh, he talks about black people the same way, and he, some in some places it's so bad. Um, and for example, an essay he wrote for Salon, I think it was, um, called uh, Your American and Negroid Character. And he, he was so bad that people were writing to his secretary saying things like, you know, Young is way too intelligent to have opinions like this, right? So we really can't save Young from a charge of racism. It, it's flagrant in places. It's highly unpleasant. Uh, I think it's one of the main things that has resulted in most young analysts being white with a few black. And um, I talked to uh, Fanny Brewster about this. She's an expert on it and has, and has written books about it. And I like her attitude. Um, she sees it, of course, and, and says, uh, yeah, you know, yes, as a black person, I, I'm, I find this difficult reading. Um, and her attitude is, while being aware of this and not really dismissing it, we also need to focus on what Jung has given us that's of lasting value. And this reminds me in turn of something Bell Hooks said to James Hillman along similar lines. And so that's how I tend to read Jung. I, I do not dismiss the racist aspects of what he gave us, but, but unlike with Heidegger's thought, I don't think racism is intrinsic to Jungian psychology. I think there's a lot in it that is actually anti-racist. Um, to Jung's credit. So, and the anti-Semitism charge comes mainly from how Jung belonged to a psychological organization that had uh, connections to some of the higher-ups in the Nazi hierarchy. We know from Jung's biographers, however, that one of the reasons Jung stayed in that organization was to provide psychological profiles of leading Nazis to the American Office of Strategic Services, which is the forerunner of the CIA. So basically, Young was spying on the Nazis. <laughs> so um, that, that was the reason he did that. And uh, he does make other comments that, that are anti-Semitic, but that, again, that doesn't seem to be a key part of what his thought was all about. So we read Young bearing in mind that that was a part of his bias. So that's part of what is wrapped up in everything else. There is also a streak of sexism and homophobia in Jung as well, and we should be aware of that. Um, Jung did a lot of work on bringing what he called the feminine back into consciousness, and he emphasized the need to honor that. So that's to his credit. But when it came to dealing with uh, actual women instead of archetypal feminine principles, he was quite the patriarch. So we just need to note that about him as well. Um, especially when he would do things like encourage women to be muses for men. So obviously we're, we're living in a time where we need to just be beyond all that. Something that I've noticed about these founding figures is that they're actually quite complex. And sometimes my students... Uh, understandably want to reduce them to either accept or reject and it's impossible to do that I'm thinking about you know Freud's really lamentable comments about feminine psychology just really awful um, comparable to Jung's comments about black people just ugh. and yet there was Freud's letters to Lou Andreas Salome who was an analyst he trained and he was supporting her financially and saying things to her like, you, you are the best of us. You go where we can't follow. And so there was that side of Freud too. So they're both there, right? And it's the same with Jung and some of his weaknesses and flaws. He was definitely a human being and a highly complex one into the bargain. So that's something that we need to know about Jung. <laughs>
Likewise, with his relations with the natural world, he tends to describe nature as seeming animate and full of presences because of human projections. His alchemical theory is largely based on that, which is why a number of us have pushed back on it and said, yes, he gave us a lot of valuable insight about how alchemy is a wisdom tradition, very psychologically deep, but the idea of nature being animate and alive because we project onto it is a carryover of this long dualism that ha that goes so far back in history where matter is seen as passive and feminine uh, and human life and mind are seen as active and masculine. So Jung definitely has that bias as well. But even while having that bias in his personal life, he tended to be kind of animistic and treat things as though they had their own minds. When he would lose his pipe, he would say, it's been magicked away, right? And it'll come back when it wants to, you know? <laughs> so then there's that side of Jung as well. Although I don't consider myself a Jungian, I remain grateful for what Jung has given me. A while back, when I thought I might take a more Jungian path, it was actually my version of Jung as an imaginal character who showed up in a dream. I was at a copying machine, <laughs> copying some of Jung's text, and Jung himself, I should put that in quotes, <clears throat> um, showed up and said, no, 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 go your own path, go your own path. And uh, more recently, he showed up to criticize um, a bias I had regarding the uses of Jungian psychology uh, out in the world for things like activism. And the two can go together, but they have to go together carefully, and I wasn't being careful enough. And so I, I had a dream in which Jung brought this to my attention, and then I gave it a lot of thought, and I, I went, yeah, he was right. You know? <laughs> so There are many things that Jung developed out of Hermeticism, which is the tradition that he so clearly is a representative of. It's, it's not too, many, too much to say that Jungian psychology is an update of Hermeticism. And out of that, there are so many good things that Jung made available that I continue to use. The idea, for instance, that, that dreams are accurate pictures of what's happening on the inside, but they speak in symbols. So the whole gift of symbolic interpretation and also uh, Jung's very clear demonstration of the reality of the imaginal, which is absolutely central to my own work. I appreciate Jung's emphasis that we are here psychologically, not simply to please other people or conform to some external set of standards or even be successful, but to become who we really are, to really live our myth. And so I lean on this idea when I do personal myth work with people. And uh, I also appreciate Jung giving me permission to be an introvert and saying, well, some of us are just like this, you know, <laughs> as he himself was. And also for my extroverted colleagues and friends and students, giving them permission to be extroverts and really taking the time to develop these ideas in his work. And it's so enriching to start to understand a psychology so different from my own and to not only have that help my relationships with extroverted people, but to find the extrovert in myself as well. So there we have it, Jung as a psychologist in search of soul, and also as he put it, in search of kindling a light in the darkness of mere being. Thank you.